2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Father, profound statement by your servant Paul. And I pray you will bring us revelation, even this morning as we seek to understand. I pray, Father, that these would not simply be words heard, but would be seeds planted. I ask, Father, for your word to do what you promised it would, and that is not come back to you empty without succeeding in the matter for which you sent it. You sent us your word this very morning. May we receive it and be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just saw yesterday, in between performances, was home for about an hour, and and I was reading uh, a news app, and I saw an interesting article about a Georgia family, maybe you heard this, whose son sent a balloon containing a message to his father in heaven, his dad who had died and gone on. And that message in that balloon was located on Wednesday and discovered about 20 miles from his home. Suzanne Edwards told Fox 5 Atlanta social media producer Marnie Williams that her family retrieved the letter and balloon from the backyard of a home in Monroe. Enclosed in the balloon was also a picture of a boy smiling, standing next to a man and a woman presumed presumed to be his parents. The boy, his name is Alejandro, saw his father die in the streets of Colombia when he was just four years old. And now, every Christmas and every birthday, he releases a balloon with a message and a picture in it to get to his dad. Interesting. The letter itself read as follows. Dad... I wish you were here so we could have fun together. I wish you a Merry Christmas. I hope you tell God to give me those presents. <laughs> and he writes, I hope you are happy in heaven. If you are, okay, then tell me. I love you, Alejandro. I hope you are happy in heaven. Interesting. From, from the mouths of babes and infants, right? Do you think he is? Do you think he's happy in heaven? Do you think heaven is a joyful place? Do you think it's a place of great happiness and and peace and contentment and wonder and splendor? Or do you think this life's better? It's, It's a thought that I come back to often. Being heavenly minded. I think we are called... As followers of Jesus, to be heavenly-minded people. And one of the greatest successes of Satan in this world has been this culture, which has us so worldly-minded, so focused on the things of the flesh and the things of our schedules and our busyness and our and our products and, and what we're about and the things that we do. And we get so driven by all these things that we are very earthly-minded as people. But to be heavenly minded, I believe that is what we are called to. That is to be our longing, our desire. And the only way, the only way to know for certain that heaven is a joyful place, a happy place, a place that we want to go, is to get a glimpse. To get a picture in it, uh, in our minds uh, of it. And and I'm not talking about the claims of, of Betty Edie or Raymond Moody. Or Todd and Colton Burpo. Those who say, you know, that they died and went and saw and came back to tell. No, I'm talking about revelations down through time given by God. He's given multiple pictures of heaven. Multiple images, things for us to see, to to understand. Things that, that draw out our spirits. 
that do cause us to long for more than this life. He gives revelations, apocalypses is the word, where we get the word apocalypse, which does not mean global upheaval. It's not a call to Bruce Willis to come save us from a comet. Apocalypse is literally unveiling. And there have been multiple times throughout history where God has pulled aside the veil and allowed us to look in, allowed people to see and even to describe what they saw of heaven. One of the earliest, turn in your Bibles if you would, keep a finger in 2 Corinthians, go all the way back to Exodus. Exodus 24. One of the earliest visions of heaven, and it wasn't seen by one man, and it wasn't just seen by four men, it was seen by 74. On Mount Horeb, as Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, and the 70 elders of Israel, well, let me read it to you. Exodus 24, verse 9, Then Moses went up, the people of Israel all gathered around the base of what we call Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the son of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate, and they drank. God invited them to dinner. They went up the mountain, and there they had a feast before the Lord, a covenant meal, if you will. It was the first of what would be many, many covenant meals between them and God. But on this particular day, as they stood on the mountain, as they supped on the mountain with the Lord, they saw, they had this amazing heavenly vision. Now, if you're a Bible student, you might say, I thought no one could see God and live. In fact, further on in the book of Exodus, God will tell Moses just that. You can't see my face and live. And I thought that no one had seen God at any time. Well, John chapter 1, John the Apostle says that. No one's seen God. So how is this possible that they could have this experience? And and I believe they couldn't look him in the face. I believe what they saw. In fact, the description is very interesting. They saw a sapphire pavement and his feet. So what they experienced was a manifestation of God, but not seeing God in his fullness, in his glory, in his face. It would have wiped him out. But they saw his feet. I, I think that they looked up through this sapphire pavement, this heavenly pavement, and they could see through it transparently and there was God. There were the feet of God and the rest was over their heads. (laughs) The rest they just couldn't take in. The rest would be too much for their little hearts to take, but they had that, that heavenly vision. It reminds me, by the way, when you get in over your head, just remember that everything remains under His feet. So you may not feel like you can deal with it or handle it. It's too much. It is literally overwhelming. Well, it's underwhelming to God. He can handle it. Visions of heaven. Isaiah caught a great vision of heaven. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, he said, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of His robe filling the temple. The train of His robe. I get to wear a cape as Drosselmeyer. I'm telling you what, capes need to come back. <laughs> capes are cool. This thing is floor length and it flows. It, oh, it's, anyway, sorry. So he saw the Lord. Ezekiel saw that great vision of heaven. You want just a mind-blowing picture? Read Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel chapter 10. In both instances where he describes what he saw in the heavenly beings there and how they moved about. And the Lord there, amazing visions. He says, I saw the heavens opened and I saw visions of God. The Lord has given us clear and unadulterated visions. Micaiah also saw the Lord. 1 Kings 22 verse 19. Daniel saw Jesus, called him the Ancient of Days. As he took his seat among the thrones of heaven. Daniel chapter 7. And there are actually more visions and revelations listed in the New Testament scriptures even than in the Hebrew scriptures. Visions of heaven. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. Peter the apostle, he quotes Joel 
2.28, saying, It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my Spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. God is, it has no problem with pulling back the veil that we might see in. Acts 7.56 Stephen, in his martyrdom, as he is being pummeled by stones, cried out, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Heavenly visions. And of course, John was in the mix, wasn't he? The entire book of Revelation is one vision after another. Chapters 4 and 5, he is actually in heaven Chapter 12, he's in heaven again. Chapter 19, and then chapter 20, 21, 22, he sees not only heaven, but he sees the future and the millennial kingdom and then the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. He sees it all in this amazing, remarkable vision. And among all of these is the servant of Christ, Paul. Paul, who had many revelations and perhaps had the most unique, at least in description, of any of the visions that we read of in Scripture. Go back and look at this, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, where Paul says, Boasting is necessary, though it is not profitable, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Yes, the word is harpazo, raptured. Paul says, I know this man. Now he's talking about himself. I'll explain that in a minute. But who was caught up to the third heaven. Understand that in Jewish theology, there were three. They considered the first heaven just to be the atmosphere, the blue sky. And the second heaven to be the starry skies of outer space. And then the third heaven to be God's place. So for Paul to say, I saw a man caught up to the third heaven. He saw the third heaven. He's talking about a revelation of God's throne room, of God's heavenly kingdom. Paul experienced that. Verse 3, and I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I don't know. God knows was caught up into paradise and heard, note this, inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now Paul is talking about himself. He talks in the third person because he has to distance himself from himself. And there's a reason for that. But he only gives a one-word description of heaven. This is why it's the most unique revelation that we read in the scriptures. Because in all the others, you get some picture, even if it's just sapphire and feet. You get something, you know, pictures of seraphim and and cherubim and and angelic beings moving about and elders around the thrones. We see all these things in these other visions. Paul tells us nothing but one word. He uses the word paradisos. In the Greek, it's paradise. I was caught up, or this man was caught up to paradise. Now that word is instructive if you want to dig a little bit, because the word paradisos means an enclosed orchard, an enclosed garden, or a walled forest. And I think it parallels beautifully the new Jerusalem spoken of in Revelation 21 and 22. Study that out on your own time. It's a beautiful picture. But we're not talking about some ethereal, spacey thing. The paradisos that that Paul refers to, that John talks about in Revelation, it is beautiful. It's, It's more wondrous, more glorious than the Garden of Eden ever was. As perfect as Eden was. Paul raptured to paradise, but he was not allowed to say anything else about it. Just that it was paradise. So as we look at this Wednesday night, the question arose, why... Tell us you had a vision at all. I mean, it's like saying, I've got a secret. You're just driving me nuts, Paul. I had a vision, can't tell you about it. What? Then why are you telling us? Because he has to. Please understand, the Apostle Paul has to share this. He's in the middle of giving this brilliant fool's speech. 2 Corinthians 11 and 12 is the fool's speech of Paul. And he is speaking as a fool, and he is speaking boastfully. Why? Because he's speaking not only to the church at Corinth, but to the foolish, boasting, false super-apostles. 
These guys were full of swagger. And Paul is really making a contrast between himself and them, the super apostles, who probably themselves claimed to have ecstatic visions and and revelations, and they were braggarts and men of bravado. And so Paul, Paul also claims a revelation, but claims it differently. G. Campbell Morgan had this to say, and, and, and it may cause you to think twice about even sharing revelations. Not that you shouldn't. Sometimes revelations are given to be shared. But listen, he said, how often people have wanted to tell me about their visions. I'm always suspicious. I want to know what they had supper for the night before. If people have visions of this sort, that is the type of vision that Paul had, seeing heaven caught up like that, if people have visions of this sort, they tend to be silent about them. Hey, Paul had been for 14 years. Paul hadn't told anyone. As far as we know, this is the first time he's even mentioned having this remarkable, glorious vision. Why is he sharing it now? Again, Paul is boasting as a servant. Super apostles boasted as great men of renown and religion. And Paul is boasting as a servant of Christ, as he says back in chapter 11, verse 23. In fact, listen to this. He says, are they Hebrews, verse 22, chapter 11? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? And he goes, (laughs) I speak as if insane. I more so. And when he says, I more so, literally he's saying, I'm a super servant. You're super apostles, I'm a super servant. You're exalting yourself as an apostle, I am super low, man. I am as low as it goes. I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And that's what the whole fool speech is about. This contrast back and forth between their arrogance and Paul's servanthood. And what Paul says throughout this, and what is the remarkable thing about the boast, is that his servanthood is not proved by his power or his visions or his strength or his might. His servanthood is proved in his weaknesses. And over and over he talks about how he is weak, how he is frail, how he's beaten up, how he's torn down, how his life is one mess after another, how hard it all is. He boasts in these weak places And then he has to mention this ecstatic vision for one reason and one reason alone. He has to bring them around to the final boast. And Paul's final boast in this speech is a weakness he calls his thorn in the flesh. I got to talk to you about a thorn. But I explain, I got to explain why I have the thorn. Okay, I had a vision. But because of the visions. Well, listen to it. Verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. I got a thorn. The word thorn in the Greek is skolops. Skolops. It's it's used in various ways. Literally, it means a sharp, pointed piece of wood. But it says nothing about size. Because a skolops could be either as small as a splinter or a little thorn, or it could be as, as large as a tent stake. In fact, it could be even larger. It could be as large as an impaling stake. So skolops can be tiny or it can be huge. But not only do we not know what Paul's revelation exactly was, other than paradisos, paradise, we also don't know what the thorn was. He doesn't tell us. We don't know if it was even in the form of a little splinter, just irritating and bugging him, or if it was something like an impaling stake. We have no idea. Barnett, commentator, wrote a substantial library of opinion as to the nature of Paul's scolops has been created. It's possible the Corinthians themselves did not know what it meant. When he said thorn in the flesh, some may have known, probably not many, if any, really knew what was going on. (laughs) But let's make three reasonable guesses here. Let me just give you more three generic categories of, of what this thorn might have been in the life of Paul. And the first one is very simply a painful physical malady. It may have been some ongoing issue. 
that Paul had to deal with in the flesh, in the body, in, in his physical self. Uh, when he went on his first missionary journey, we read about it in the book of Acts. He goes through Galatia. And we know that while in Galatia, he suffered some kind of pretty terrible sickness. In fact, in the book of Galatians, he talks about how it kept him in that area. And he had to minister to them out of his illness for a substantial amount of time. And so this this may be it. It may be the thorn in the flesh. This kind of chronological, ongoing, continual problem that just kept coming back to Paul over and over. I, several years ago took students on mission trips to Honduras. Um, and at the last of these mission trips, over the years, I took a group from Southern California and had a young man on that trip named Kevin, Kevin Leibach. Kevin is now a youth pastor in Texas. And Kevin was on this trip, had a great time, came home and got really sick. Went to the doctor and found out he had malaria. And he tried to blame me. I'm like, dude, did you take your pills? But he had contracted malaria. He was the only student in all the students that I took to Honduras who actually contracted malaria. Well, Kevin, to this day, about every year, every year and a half, he goes through about a week of flu-like symptoms. You know, he'll get nauseated and he'll get a fever and he knows it's malaria. And the doctors have told him that's going to be with him the rest of his life. He's like, thanks, Rick. I'm like... (laughs) So Paul may have had that. In fact, Tertullian in the second century supposed that it was malaria that did this. It gave him literally malarial migraines that would knock him off his feet and earaches. We don't know why Tertullian says that, but being in the second century, only you know within a hundred years of, of Paul, perhaps that's what it was. We also wonder if maybe with this painful physical malady that it was eye trouble. And in fact, in the book of Galatians, which we're going to get to in short order, right after the first of the year, Paul talks about, you would, in Galatians 4, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them, them to me. He's saying, I, I knew that you cared that much about me, you would have done that. Well, why would they pluck out their eyes if he wasn't having trouble with his? And in Galatians chapter 6, verse 11, he says, see with what large letters I'm writing to you. This is my pen, implying that perhaps he couldn't write small because he couldn't see. So maybe a painful physical malady, malaria, headaches, earaches, eye problems, we don't know, but that's a possibility. Secondly, the thorn in his flesh may have been a piercing personal issue. We went into this in depth on Wednesday night, but Paul, and he gives us even in the listing back at the end of chapter 11, Paul was let down out of Damascus in a basket And he lists that among his weaknesses. Why? Because the people who were gunning for him in Damascus were Jews. And what's interesting to watch is throughout Paul's ministry career, he is dogged by Jews. Now, he's dogged by Jewish people rejecting the message of Christ, but they're not the worst. He is dogged even more so by those we've called the Judaizers. That would follow Paul everywhere he went. He would teach grace, they would teach law. He would teach Jesus and forgiveness and freedom and salvation, and they would teach keeping Torah. And even in Corinth, that was the problem. We believe that these super apostles were stirring up legalism, religion. You've got to do these things, keep these laws, maintain these standards, or you're really not one of Christ's. And Paul was followed everywhere he went by this. And this personal issue could very easily be a thorn in the flesh. Think about that. If you're a missionary and everywhere you go, people are following you, messing up the message of grace. Well, he had to deal with that his whole life. Physical, personal, one more possibility, and that is spiritual. A sharp spiritual struggle. Listen to the verse again. He says, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, literally an angelos satanos. One of Satan's angels was given to me. Paul's description is interesting. Now, we could just say evil's dogging me when I have a headache, you know. We could say Satan's after me when I'm trying to teach and people are undermining that. But he says literally an an angelos here of, of Satan, perhaps. And some think it was an actual demon that just attacked Paul everywhere he went. That was trying to take him down, perhaps through physical problems, perhaps through mental and emotional stuff, maybe depression. We don't know for sure. 
But if this was an actual demon plaguing Paul, well, we've seen that happen before, and with righteous people too. Have you considered God's servant Job? See, that's what God said to Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? And Satan said, well, yeah, I've been down there, I've seen him. Big deal, so he's righteous. All you got to do is take stuff away from him and he'll curse your name. God said, all right, go for it. But spare him. So Satan goes down. You may have read the story. He goes down and he destroys Job's life. He, he kills his children. He takes his flocks and his herds, wipes out his servants. All that Job has lost in a heartbeat. I mean, literally overnight. And Job is left to himself, but will not curse the Lord. So Satan, frustrated, goes back up to God. God says, have you considered my servant Job? Satan goes, well, yeah, skin for skin. Harm his physical body and he'll curse you. And God says, Job chapter 2, verse 6, behold, he's in your power. Only spare his life. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. We've seen this happen before. Now, if that whole Job story freaks you out, go listen to the teaching. Because we went through the entire book. And it is a remarkable battle of righteousness and goodness and glory and holiness, that of God, versus what Satan tries to do. But maybe that's it. Maybe Paul, like Job, is dealing with the same kind of thing. We don't know. Whatever it was, physical, personal, or spiritual, please understand that Paul was literally tormented by this thorn. Meaning what exactly? The word tormented is an interesting word in the Greek. It's easy to remember. It's kolafizo. Kolafizo. It's not what happens when you pop a soda can. Kolafizo. You know, shake it up. Kolafizo. Help you remember that. Kolafizo literally means to strike with a fist. Now, what's interesting to me is that's the second time Paul has used that kind of terminology in the fool's speech. And both times are related. Two synonyms. They're different Greek words, but they're synonyms. The other word is dero, which means to hit in the face. And now he says to strike with a fist. In the first one, well, look back. Chapter 11, verse 20. He says, for you tolerate it, speaking to the church at Corinth, if anyone enslaves you, if anyone devours you, if anyone takes advantage of you, if anyone exalts himself, and by the way, that's what false teachers do. All four of those. And the fifth. Anyone hits you in the face. If anyone punches you in the face. And now, in this thorn in the flesh, Paul says, it's tormenting me. It's, it's striking me with a fist. It's buffeting me. It is beating me up. What's the parallel? In both cases, the enemy will seek, does seek, by any means necessary to bully, to intimidate, and to coerce you away from faith. To shut you down. And he will use physical things in your life to shut you down. It's just too hard to get out of bed. He will use uh, social, personal things. I'm not going to church if that guy's showing up. And he will use spiritual issues as well. To try to take you down. Satan loves to use thorns. He's a thorny dude. Now it's probably good why we, that that we don't know exactly what Paul's thorn was. He doesn't tell us what it is. He just calls it this thorn in the flesh, this messenger of Satan, this stake in the skin. I'm glad that we don't know. Why is that? Because it makes it so personally relatable for every single one of us. It makes it possible for us to look at the story and say, yeah, I got a thorn. In fact, do you? Do you have a thorn in the flesh? Do you have a stake in the skin? Do you have something in your life that this ongoing kind of problematic thing, maybe a physical condition or a personal conflict or a spiritual concern, something that on occasion makes you winch from pain, pull back, or worse, make you feel like you've been literally speared. Everyone's got one. Everyone has a thorn in the flesh. And some of the thorns are the size of a splinter. Other thorns are a little bit bigger. But everyone's got one. I was talking with Mark Harris after first service. He told me the most outrageous true story in the operating room, in the emergency room. 
And Mark was serving as a doctor. A guy came in. He was screaming his head off. Just screaming like a baby. And, and Mark's like, what is the deal with this guy? I've got a splinter. I've got a splinter. I've got a splinter. He had a tiny little metal sliver in his ankle. Crying like a baby. And Mark's just looking at him going, I just pulled an awl out of a guy's forearm. And, and he didn't scream as much as you're screaming. The guy was just couldn't, wouldn't bend his legs. Just sitting there just screaming and screaming. And Mark said, I went with the scalpel to go and, and touch the sliver. And when I touched it, his thigh moved. And he began to feel along his leg, and what looked like a tiny splinter in his ankle was actually a metal shaft that ran all the way up to his groin. Yeah. Mark said it was one of the most bizarre things he had ever seen. The guy was walking along a a pier, and there was a big metal post holding up the pier, and he slipped, and his leg ran alongside the post, and this huge thing went right up his leg. Some of you are grossing out right now. (laughs) True story. Hey, my friends, listen, what looks like a little splinter to you and someone else could be huge. So don't judge. Don't immediately assume because what's that little problem you've got? Come on, get over it. Yeah, to you it may not seem like a big deal, but to that person it could run all the way up the leg. It could be horribly painful. The point is we all have them. We all have something. Some splinter, some thorn, some issue, something that spears or impales or hurts or even just irritates, but it's there and it all begs a thorny paradox. A question that even as I read Paul, it it, it makes me want to know, want to understand. Listen, Paul says in verse 8, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Come on, Lord. Wait a minute. He implored the Lord. Paul knew something. He says this thorn was given to me. Not forced upon me, it was given to me. And he asked the Lord to take it away. Why? Because Paul knew his thorn was subject to God's will. Paul knew his thorn was of use to God. In fact, Paul's not asking Satan to stop. He's asking God to remove it. Because he knew only God could. He knew only God could unimpale him. He begged the Lord three different times to do it. Have you? Have you ever begged the Lord to relieve you of of some physical problem? (laughs) Andrew Lefebvre right now is looking at me like, dude, you have no idea. (laughs) I'm going to tell you about Andrew in just a second. Have you ever begged God to relieve you of some social struggle? Of some spiritual fight. And, and, and you just, it's just, man, it's, it's either irritating or it's painful. Lord, why don't you do something about this? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to face this? Please stop it. Paul did. Paul begged the Lord. Implored is the word. And he says three times, please take this away. You know what Paul understood and the reason why he went to the Lord? He understood that though the devil uses thorns to intimidate and to harm and to hurt, as Paul later would write, we know that God causes all things to work together for good. For those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. All things. That means stakes and thorns. Problems, irritants in our lives. There's grace here. In fact, I would consider what Paul is sharing here with the church at Corinth one of the greatest passages on grace in the entire Bible. Because of what he says. Stakes and thorns. We could go all over the scriptures without, you know, we could leave the text and go everywhere to find out about how God's grace works even in thorny situations. But we can stay right here. And without leaving, we see a number of things that thorns do. And I want you to consider these this morning. Number one, stakes and thorns bring us to God. They bring us to God. Some 79 times in the scriptures, we hear the exact phrase, cried out. They cried out. He cried out. She cried out. Over and over and over. This is, this is God's book, right? Right? These are supposed to be people at least who have some kind of relationship with God, most of them. 
And yet all over the scriptures, they're crying out to the Lord, crying out, crying out. David says in Psalm 3, verse 4, I was crying out to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. Crying out to God. Psalm 106, or 107, verse 6. And then four more times in that psalm, verse 13, 19, and 28. Psalm 107 says, They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them, saved them out of their distresses. And so a tormented and distressed Paul said, I implore you, Lord. Now think about this. Don't you find... Don't you find that your heart goes heavenward more often when you're in pain than when you're just cruising along and everything's great? See, this is the conversation I just had with Andrew out in the foyer. Those of you who are unaware, I think most of you know that Andrew's been battling cancer for over a year now. And we were talking about how it's a roller coaster ride. Most most of us don't know. We don't understand what it's like to wake up in the morning and have no idea what's happening in your body. And you have to fight that battle and have to maintain faith and to keep praying and asking the Lord and and good times and bad times and all that that gets mixed into it. And you want to say, what are you doing? Why me? Why this? But you know what Andrew said? It's forced him to press into the Lord like he never has. He said, back before when I was just cruising along, it was all great. I have my faith and I'm I'm near quoting him right now. I didn't ask his permission either. He said, I have my faith, but I never talk to God like I do now. That's because thorns, thorns point us to God. They, they bring us to God. And when I'm distressed, that's when I'm crying out. But you know, when everything is just copacetic and I'm cruising along in life, those are the times where three, four, five days go by and I go, <laughs> I haven't even prayed. I haven't prayed Sunday morning. I was in front of the whole church. I had to look religious. Thorns are not a bad thing if they bring us to God, and they do. And Jesus cried out to God because of thorns, because of stakes in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7 tells us, In the days of his flesh he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety, that is his, his reverence. And then the Hebrew writer says this, I love it. Although he was a son... He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Now that confuses people. They say, wait a minute, Jesus learned? If he was God, wouldn't he know all things? The word learned is probably best translated understood. He understood obedience from a human perspective. And that is something that while God knows all things, he would experience humanity like you, like me, not so that, not so that he could get it, but so that we could know he got it. Does that make sense? So that we could look at Jesus and say, yeah, he really does understand me. Because he really did walk this out in the flesh just like me. And he dealt with thorns just like I do. By the way, how many times did Paul implore the Lord to remove this thorn from his flesh? Three times. Three times. Now, three is interesting because it is a Hebrew figure of speech. You may not have known this, but it literally means ceaselessly, continually, again and again and again, we might say. I cried out to the Lord over and over and over, three times. And when a phrase is used three times or, or, or expressed three times, I cried out to the Lord three times, he may very well have been saying, I have been continuous on this thing. I have been crying out and calling out and praying to the Lord. I have not ceased. Luke 18, verse 1, Jesus taught them to pray and not lose heart. Keep bringing it, man. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Paul says, pray without ceasing. And it's entirely likely that what Paul is talking about when he says, I I asked the Lord three times, is he's saying, I have not stopped asking the Lord to relieve me of this pain And I'll tell you one thing about Andrew and Melissa, and I'm sorry to make such a point out of you two this morning. I'm not meaning to embarrass you. But I can tell you this much, and this is great news if you haven't heard. Back in August, I did a PET scan, and if you you can imagine the outline of Andrew's body and the whole thing being white, his bones white, but it looked like someone had just taken black paint and splattered his body. So cancer everywhere. 
had another PET scan and they went down on Wednesday to check on the results, not knowing, roller coaster, what would be the outcome. It's completely clear. No cancer. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But I'll tell you something, Andrew in wisdom says, yeah, but I'm still fighting. What are you fighting for? The battle's over. No, the war is still on. And this is a glorious victory. And, and a Merry Christmas, by the way, for your family, I think. Cancer's gone. But the battle continues. Why is the cancer gone? Because people have been consistent, and Andrew and Melissa have been constant in prayer. They asked the Lord three times? No, they've been asking the Lord every day, every hour, every moment for a year. And that's the kind of prayer that we're called to. And thorns do it, don't they? Pains and problems and difficulties and struggles in our lives bring us to God. The second thing that they do, oh wait, before I get there. Hmm. How many times was it again? Three times. Listen to this. Matthew 26, verse 36, Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. He went beyond them a little farther and he fell down on his face and he prayed, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. He comes back. He finds them sound asleep. He's like, dudes, can't you stay awake and pray one hour? Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. And then the Bible tells us he went away a second time and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time. The parallel is fascinating to me that Paul implores the Lord three times, just as Jesus implored the Lord three times, Take the thorn. Take this cup of suffering. Take the wrath away from me. So Paul was very similar to Jesus in this. But here's the point. The number three in the scriptures is a wonderful number. Because it speaks of life. It speaks of revelation. It was on the third day that Jesus rose from the dead. Yes, he cried out three times in Gethsemane. But then three days later, up from the grave, he arose. And there's new life there. And that's, that's this parallel between the two. Three times, man, new life always comes after pain. It always comes after hardship. It always comes or often comes after death. Jesus prays three times and he dies anyway. The cup was not taken from him. Well, wait a minute. We just read in Hebrews 5 that he prayed and his prayers were heard. But if his prayers were heard in Gethsemane, And he went to the cross anyway. Obviously, God didn't hear his prayers. Yes, he did, because three days later, Jesus rose again. And sometimes we have to pass through the cross, pass through the thorns, pass through the struggles. But those stakes and thorns, they bring us to God. Secondly, stakes and thorns irritate us to grace. They irritate us to grace. Listen to this, verse 9. Paul writes, as he cries out to the Lord, implores the Lord. He said to me, Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you. God's answer. Now, if I was answering someone like that, it'd probably be more of a cop-out because I don't have any other answer to give. God says, my grace. He's not saying, shut up, Paul. (laughs) I mean, he's not. Let's track with me on this. God, take this thorn away. Paul, You got my grace. It's enough. That's not what he's saying. When he says my grace is sufficient for you, the word sufficient means satisfaction. It means contentment. God said to Paul, look, my grace is where you find your satisfaction. It's where you're content. It's not in the removal of thorns. It's in the presence of my grace that you are satisfied both immediately and eternally, obviously eternally, because heaven's coming. And grace bought that. But His grace, it permeates the life of faith. It gives us the opportunity, man, to be at peace with God beyond comprehension, beyond circumstance, when it doesn't make any sense at all. Those thorns and those stakes, man, they irritate, they bug, but they drive me right into that place of godly satisfaction, of grace. 
And sometimes that's what it takes, man. Sometimes it takes a little irritation, a thorn, a sliver, or a stake to get me to realize how dissatisfied I really am. Think about Adam and Eve back in the garden. They had it all. Adam and Eve in Geth- not Gethsemane, in Eden, Adam and Eve in Eden had everything anybody could ever want. In fact, we've been fighting to get back into the garden ever since. And yet, what they wanted was outside the garden. Now we want something else. We want something more. We want to experience another thing. And so they sinned. Adam sinned, and God in the curse, listen to the curse of Adam. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. You will sweat in your face. You will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for your dust and to dust you shall return. Bam. Mic drop. Deal with it. What's God doing here? You need to understand and any right thinking parent who punishes a child never punishes for punishment's sake. It's not, oh, you ate the fruit, you're getting thorns. See how you like that. (laughs) No, what, what is the Lord doing? They are in the grace of the garden. They want something else, so God gives them thorns and thistles. I'll give you something else. Why? So that it would irritate them to want to get back into the garden. So it would draw us back to paradisos. So it would bring us to the place of longing for grace. Thorns do that. Thorns do that. They irritate us to grace. By the way, when you read Paul, please understand that this man didn't just write about grace. He didn't just theologize about grace. He lived it. It was straight out of his own personal experience. This was life and eternity for Paul. He wrote to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1.13, and said, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, Yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Everything Paul taught as he went church to church, bringing the gospel of God's grace, it was a grace that was experienced by him every moment of every day. And when someone has a thorn that ends up being a shaft and deals with that kind of pain and nuisance and problem, and then they tell you about the grace of God? Now that's someone I can listen to. That's someone I'm going to believe. And Paul taught grace from his own life. And if you happen to be worn by a thorn, or aching from a staken, if you're dealing with some kind of Problem, some prickling problem that is just grating on you, what would Paul say? Hebrews 4.16, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace and help in time of need because time of need is when we need grace. So thorns, they bring us to God. They irritate us to grace. Number three, thorns take down pride. Quickly, verse 9. Paul goes on saying... The last part of verse 9, he says, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Thorns take down pride. And this entire fool's speech was a stark contrast between the super apostles, as I said, and the servant of Christ, Paul. Back up in verse 30 of chapter 11. He says, If I have to boast, I will boast of what pertains to my weakness. Paul had a pride issue. Did you know that? He had pride that needed dealing with. What pride is that? Jewish pride. Man, he was an Israelite among Israelites of the tribe of Benjamin. He had it going on where Judaism was concerned. And when he got saved by Jesus, no doubt, Paul thought, trained at the feet of Gamaliel, I'm the guy to save the Jews. What happened? Damascus. 
the Jews tried to kill him. He's let down out of the wall. He lists it among one of his most great weak moments in all of his ministry. Why? Because he thought he was being sent to his own people. That's where his strength was. That's where his learning was. But God said, no. No, you see, my strength is perfected in your weakness. You're going to Gentiles, Paul. And what's ironic about Paul's ministry is his entire life, he keeps trying to go to the Jews. Everywhere he goes, he goes first to the synagogue. He gets kicked out, and then he goes to the Gentiles. And God's like, okay, you're going to go to the Jews, but I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. And that Jewish pride in Paul would just go away. And the pride that might rise up because of revelations, because of his relationship with Jesus, because of all that he was taught and shown, that pride would go away. Here's what's difficult about this. I know some very humble people who are dealing with thorns and tent pegs. People that you look at and go, why does he have a thorn? Why is she walking around with with a stake in her shoulder? They don't have a pride issue. Let me say this gently and lovingly. We all do. We all have pride issues. Pride can look like arrogance. Pride can look a lot like ambition. It can look like self-sufficiency. You know, the guy, the the lady who has it all together. Pride can look like self-confidence. Pride can even be the person who plays the victim. In fact, that's one of the more prideful places people tend to go is self-victimization. Oh, woe is me. That's pride. Why? Because it's all about you. Pride is any time it becomes all about me and it keeps me from God. So he will allow, no, he will use thorns and stakes in our lives to bring down pride. To bring us to God. To take down pride. And whatever the other point was, he'll do that. (laughs) By the way, it was Corinthian pride that caused them to receive the false apostles in the first place. My opinion. What do you mean? Let me put it this way. It is pride in the church today that causes people to want a 10-minute homily, a couple of worship songs, and then they're out. It's pride when we go to church to hear things that make us feel all warm and fuzzy and don't challenge us. It's pride. It's religious pride. Paul described it this way, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Listen, if you don't like me, praise the Lord. You don't have a teacher in accordance with your own desires. (laughs) That guy just irritates me. Good. Let me be the thorn in your life if that's what it takes. (laughs) It's a problem in the church. We are not here to feel good. We are here to look beyond this life to glory. We are here to see Jesus. Thorns bring us to God. They irritate to grace. That was the other one. And they take down pride. Fourth and final, thorns develop godly power. Watch this. Verse 9 again. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Power. And what was the single greatest example of the power of Christ? Was it preaching with authority? Man, when he preached, it blew people away. He was powerful. Maybe it was walking on water. That's that's pretty studly, right? Was it calming the storm? You want to talk about power? Wouldn't you love just to be able to say, hush, and everything goes still? I'd like to do that with the planes sometimes. (laughs) Hush. They all land, you know. Is that power? Was it healing the sick? Was it raising up the dead? Now, you might be tempted to say, power of God was in the resurrection of Jesus. And I would kind of agree, 
but I think there was a more powerful moment. It was the most powerful moment in the entire life of Christ, in fact, in all eternity, and it came to a head when he took the whole crown of thorns on his head, when the nails went into his hands, when the spear shafted his side. That was Jesus' most powerful moment. Why? Because my power, God says, is perfected in weakness. And at the time where God himself was at his absolute weakest is when the power was come, was given to disarm the authorities, to take down the enemy, to break the power of sin and death. That was power. But it was born in weakness. In that weakest of moments. And that's why Paul, with his little light momentary, momentary thorn in his flesh, that's why he says, 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block, to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, listen, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. My power, he says is perfected in weakness. And so it was. Verse 10, Paul says, Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Grace and power. You know, those two things where God is concerned cannot be separated. You cannot separate the grace of God from the power that comes with it. And grace is perfected in weakness. So power is perfected in weakness. Grace and power are divinely linked to have the one, you have the other. And again, both are perfected in weakness. Charles Spurgeon said, Oh, there must be the weakness of man, felt, recognized, and mourned over. Or else the strength of the Son of God will never be perfected in us because in the weakest of moments when you have nothing that's when as Paul also wrote you know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified and I believe that that is Paul's greatest personal revelation Greater than revelations of the heavens, which he does not describe. Greater than thrones or sapphire pavement or seraphim. Because Paul would later write in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It may take thorny little splinters in your life. For some of us, it may be big, sharp tent pegs to the head. But brothers and sisters... I pray God will use whatever it takes to bring us to the revelation of Jesus Christ.